welcome to the Funky Marketing Show. Uh, this is, as you know, the show where I'm hosting, you know, uh, different marketers, business owners, entrepreneurs, or just people that are doing good stuff for the good people. And today I have a pleasure to welcome, uh, I would like to say, to, to name him like one of the, the leaders of the young generation of B2B marketers that are doing good stuff, trying to change specific industry, uh, not only through marketing, strategy, advisory or other stuff, but also hosting uh, a podcast as well. Uh, so guys, allow me to uh, present to you or to welcome to you, uh, Mr. Matthews Cavella. Hey, what's going on, everyone? How are you doing? Hey, Mania, thanks for having me on. You almost got my last name right, but that's cool. I'll... <laughs> Scian Scianella, it's right? Sh it's Chanella. It's uh... ah, <laughs> yeah, but you're yeah. good. It happens all Chana the time. Yeah, it happens because you you ask me how to pronounce my name, and I guessed that I can pronounce your surname well. So, <laughs> oh, <you're... laughs> my mistake. <laughs> that's okay. You're good to go. Yeah, I, I want to make sure I got that right. But yo, thanks for having me on the show so much. I appreciate it. Can think of a better way to spend my Monday than you know live on <laughs> doing a live podcast. That sounds sounds like the perfect way to start the week. <laughs> yeah, it's usually like a a good a good timing because like here in Serbia it's like three p.m. so end of the working day, and in the U.S. it's usually start of the working day. So it's kind yep. of a nice nice combo. Perfect. Uh, I'm in my third cup of coffee, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> nice. So uh, like. The headline of, of this episode uh, that I choose to be is like something that is also your headline is, you know, how industrial companies can modernize their, mar their marketing strategy. And, uh, you know, as you are someone who is uh, hosting even a podcast that is talking about uh, about that topic, by the way, I love the, the, the podcast. I don't listen to it, uh, you know regularly but when i do i binge episodes and it's really great content thank you and uh you know and it's good that you're actually somebody that it's working in a in a company i don't know guys if you know about gorilla 76 but it's a great company and matt is over there the thinker and the strategist love also the how you name the position thinker, uh, yeah it's it's, it's yeah. kind of it's kind of part of the job right i mean you got to a lot of a lot of clients we work with, you know, unlike SaaS, where there's usually good systems in place regarding reporting and regarding CRM structure um, and having a marketing automation platform that goes into the CRM. A lot of times we're standing that up for the client or we're or we're doing it for them or they we go in and the CRM is not very mature. And so we're putting more things in place to 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 capture or to look to get a better look at, you know, how people are coming into their company and, and help surface recommendations based off of that. So yeah, you got to think a lot definitely in the role just cause it, it's just a, it's a requirement. And so it just kind of fits the title. Uh, but we also are fortunate to have thinker across every job title in an organization. Cause we certainly are trying to, and we like to create an ownership mentality among anyone in the company, no matter where you sit on the, the, the org chart, let's say. Sounds good. Sounds good. It, it reminds me of like what I did with, with Chief Vision Officer to kind of spark the conversation because one of the things that we are doing is actually, you know, trying to change how people are defining roles inside the companies because like we have uh, Chief Revenue Officers and it's just like somebody who was head of sales just renamed the role and that's not the change. That's just renaming things. So I was trying to kind of spark the conversation just like you are doing in a way. For sure. Yeah, it's definitely, de definitely, definitely how we approach it for sure as a company, especially with our clients. Yeah. So, uh, as you already start talking, uh, you know, when you start working with a company and when you enter the CRM, see what's over there, how are things going? What are some of the questions that you ask companies, you know, when you start working with them? That was something uh, I, I remember you had a post about it a couple of months ago, something like that, when, you know, it was kind of the similar questions that I'm asking. So, and I think not many, you know, agencies or marketers actually ask those questions before they start working with a company. You know, like, uh, what do I mean is by, you know, how do you define... Um, 
a marketing qualified lead. Or as, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, Just, I mean, to me, those things are those are so crucial, right? Like being able to define those things. I mean, some of our clients we work with don't have sales development reps or don't have like they just have territory sales managers. They just have a few people doing sales. Like they manufacturing as a space, it's un, very unlike tech in that they run very lean. They try to run as lean as possible. And so they try to literally dedicate as few resources as absolutely needed to let something function. And that's why a lot of the sales, the sales components of those are usually the biggest ones because they're very sales led. But engineering teams usually are very are, are very thinly staffed. Marketing teams even more thinly staffed. Customer service pretty thinly staffed. And like sort of the structure with a, within a manufacturing company largely revolves around having techs who can assemble or put the put the piece of machinery together to get it shipped out the door. That's a lot of lower wage um, workers. Um, and then also sales staff who's supposed to be bringing those opportunities in. And so everything that kind of funnels around that tends to not be as well. Um, as well staff. So I definitely, when I go in and I talk to a cut, we're talking to a new client, I want to understand how they're structured overall as an organization, what they think mark good marketing looks like overall. I mean, you really want to get an idea of like, cause we're going to push a digital digitally led solution, right? We're going to push content. We're going to push distribution. We're going to push ads. We're going to push um, doing things like webinars, maybe th things that they're not very used to, like leveraging your email list in a better way than than running, you know, very, you know, very lowest common denominator email marketing place. So things that things that, you know, they're not used to doing before. So getting a sense of what good looks like to them is important. So I can make sure I'm matching expectations with whatever we propose around whatever they think looks good. And then I really like to get into things about knowing What's what, what's an average deal look like for you guys? What's an average sales cycle? What's your profit margin? Because I want to know what what can you reasonably spend to acquire a customer um, that that is going to be acceptable for you? How do you define an MQL? What does your handoff look like? What's the expectation in the CRM after you hand it off? What kind of notes do y'all take? Um, and 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 by and large, those kind. Of, and the other thing is like. You know, who are your ideal customers? Like, what are their job titles? What are their industries? What is their size? Um, what questions do they ask? How much do they know about what you sell before going in? Um, knowing most of those things going in uh, is, is just critical to know in order to, to put a plan together, but also just to figure out like, how long does this, how far does this company have to go? And what's a reasonable expectation before they can, you know, start to see something out of marketing that they're happy with, right? I mean, most people, the timeline, the the timeline of expectation is usually very warped, especially for where they're at in the marketing program. You know, they expect to sign on with us and see a revenue result 60, 90 days. A lot of times they don't have the foundational elements in place to get there even within, you know, 120 days, let alone, you know, 90 or 60. So, you know, just knowing where they're at foundationally gives you a really good sense of like, okay, you can expect to see signs of life here in this amount of time. And by this amount of time, we should start seeing things that should give you a lot of encouragement that we're in the, the right direction. But most of the times when we work with people, it's, you know, we, we start at nine months because we're like, it's going to probably take for where you all are at nine months before you're at a place where you can see it really working for you. And then you're going to feel confident to keep to keep it going but you know for a lot of a, a lot of clients the expectation is the very old school lead gen playbook of you know let's let's run you know ebook ebook downloads or white paper downloads and and you know it's it's not not a very mature process in that sense and so you know asking those questions going in is really important because it it allows you to really frame expectation because we're not sitting here promising a lot of a really high amount of leads necessarily we're not trying to slam you with you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 leads a month. We're really trying to get the right, you know, 10 to 20 in um, for you that are going to convert at a higher rate. And that's that's definitely where we predicate a lot of what we're doing. What's the situation? I guess you, you have different different companies in the different stages. Is it like uh, when you enter? Do they usually have, you know, one person that tr is trying to set up the marketing team or they already, you know, are in a bigger stage when they already have a team working on some things or they don't have anybody. They're just hiring you to kind of cover up the process. 
So it's definitely a mix of all of those things. We have clients who fit each of those criteria. Um, the majority of our clients do not have a marketing department and we are completely the outsourced marketing department. So, you know, doing the foundational work, doing the website development. Uh, we don't necessarily build websites, but that is part of what we do. Um, content strategy and execution. Um, and that's that's an increasingly difficult thing to do. I know there are some who don't believe you can outsource content. We certainly are one of the few agencies who embrace that um, as part of our menu of deliverables. And we we do a good job because we take a really, you know, a methodical, well, well-researched approach with it. And then the demand gen distribution part of it, uh, primarily in the form of, of, of ads, is, is the other kind of component of our deliverables. And then on the back end, doing the reporting and, and surfacing recommendations and noticing trends and making making adjustments based off of it. So, so yeah, I mean, for, for, for most of our clients, we do all of that. And then there's other clients where they have a marketing department and they got some people in place. They're doing some things with content, but they don't really get quite how to create demand or capture it in a in a in a really effective way you know first starting with the website and trying to fix you know some really easy or some i don't want to say easy but some very noticeable conversion rate issues they're probably having on their website or looking at things like their lead handoff or saying like or looking at their google ads and saying y'all your guys google ads is way out of whack you're targeting a ton of broad match keywords you're, the conversions that you guys have set up make no sense. We need to orient this around, you know, things that actually are going to drive a business result for you. And so fixing those things at the outset, uh, I think with clients who have marketing departments and just auditing and diagnosing things that they, they maybe have not fully considered is, is another aspect of it. And then we have other clients who have bigger marketing departments, more mature marketing departments, and they want us to coach them, essentially. They're like, we don't have this competency in-house. Can you show us how to do this competency in-house? Can you help us with this or this or this? And so we have clients like that as well. I have one such client and, and they do they do really do a nice job um, with, with a lot of things that they do. They sell, you know, they sell packaging machinery and it's very interesting what they what they're doing. And like for them, the biggest thing they needed help with was reporting. They couldn't report their results very well. They didn't really have a great grip on that. And so I basically spent a lot of time working with them going because they're they're full stack HubSpot. So it was very easy to see what their yeah. impact was if you know how to work the reporting in there. And so I just went in and just like re-engineered how they they did reporting on the marketing standpoint in a way that made sense and aligned with how their sales did it. Um, identified some gaps they had in reporting and then was able to say, look, so you guys do a lot of things where you manually input attribution here, you have automated attribution here, and then you're missing kind of self-reported here. But if you put all these different sorts of ways you guys attribute deals and, and contacts together, this is actually your impact on revenue overall. Um, if you just layer some common sense on, do it too. So so I, I work with clients in, in, in that regard as well a lot. It's just helping them with helping them with reporting because a lot of the reporting that they do is is very much um, last touch, very much what the CRM tells them, you know, and I know, and, and many people who are listening to this or, 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 follow, or run the same circles that we do know that that's a, that's a flawed way to look at it. And you have to look at varying levels of detail and also layer common sense onto it. And, uh, and, and most of our clients are, are sort of blindly following what the CRM is telling them. And so I, I certainly work with all of my clients, no matter whether they don't have an apartment or they have a small one or they have a big one on that too. Yeah, agreed. Reporting is a huge is a huge part of everything. You know, just by following the right metric, you can align everything that you do before that. Right, you can figure it out. I mean, I you know, I have one <clears throat> client they want to double revenue uh, next year, but in order to do that, they need to like three x their number of customers. And so, having these conversations in order to kind of say, okay, well, you want to be here, but here's all the steps that need to happen for you to get there. And, and it's not simply just okay, let's double this and like and like pay this it's like well let's let's look at all the aspects of your of your funnel let's look who converts where and how what your volumes look like and then what your ratio analysis looks like and then we can really start to make decisions on where do we make investments what those investments investments need to look like and what needs to happen based on those investments overall so so yeah just helping clients understand how they need to get there and we're based on where they're at is also just another really critical aspect of it. Cause a lot of clients are just looking at it like, Oh, we have this many leads from organic search and we get this many customers from direct traffic. And it's like, well, you gotta, gotta look 
deeper into that. Got to get into conversion points. Um, got to got to look at all, all the things based on stages. Um, you know, contact stages and deal stages, and 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 determine all the things that that make that work. Yeah, uh, I mean, what 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 uh, what got me thinking in in the couple last couple of months was like we start working with companies. Usually, we go with you know first analyze things, then we see you mm -hmm. know. Who are the people that are converting? What's going on with that? Like compare them to the others and all those other stuff. But like companies are like, can't you just go and start creating content or start doing ads? <laughs> like, no. do we actually need to analyze things? Yeah, you should. You also need to do like a lot of, I mean, that's just the quantitative side, right? The qualitative side is just as important. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, I need to talk to your sales rep. I need to talk to the founder or the, or the president or the CEO. I need to talk to, you know, five or six of your customers. You know, I need to, there's all this qualitative stuff as well to help, to help kind of inform what I'm, what you see quantitatively and then go, okay, well now we know we need to do this. So like, yeah, I mean, clients and, and we we've struggled with this i think i think you know some agent some agencies and some departments do this where it's like all right we actually need to get the running campaigns earlier but we need to be really smart about it right and so you know one of the things i want to do is like all right well let's get to distribution but let's do some foundational aspects first let's let's have a content strategy workshop let's have a discovery workshop with you all let's understand your business well let's look at what you have for content look at what you're saying do some customer interviews let's let's from there let's start with product marketing pages right before we even get into like top top funnel content let's start with kind of the product marketing side of it um from a from a standpoint of communicating what you all do and who you do it for and how it's different and how it's how it's different and then let's distribute let's start with that as distribution while we work on more expansive content projects like getting a webinar program off the ground or getting a series of case studies off the ground or something like that so for for our clients it's like we still got to do foundational work to get to the point of trying to create demand but you know there's ways to get there faster but there's still steps you can't skip right yeah exactly i mean you gotta lay out the foundation so you know what are you building your house on basically mm -hmm. uh Absolutely. but tell me tell me uh you know what are some differences that you're seeing because like if you if we look at the linkedin if you look at other places other podcasts like people aren't talking about industrial marketing and the, how the industrial companies are doing marketing and those kind of stuff like usually it's the talk about about SaaS companies about software companies about e-commerce maybe so uh you know when you compare it to the companies that you are doing marketing for what are some of the differences uh i think a lot of the differences i see first off most most industrial companies are not recurring revenue businesses and so that's just that go that that the unit economics of that alone make what you do different right and so you have i mean there's some like so there's a, the aspect of industrial like contract manufacturing um is certainly a recurring revenue business and yeah you can you can take some some SaaS principles uh from that but if you're selling machinery you have to look at profit margin and you have to look at well what can i spend to acquire a customer but let's let's kind of let's let's get a little bit away from sort of the economics of it because i really want to get into the kind of like what they're doing strategically right and so one of the things that happen now with with you know with trade shows coming back is a lot of industrial companies are looking back to the trade show as like okay let's get out and do some shows let's go scan some badges and let's go you know, do some follow-up on them with the sales team. And that's, you know, that is just, that's a play that industrial companies have run for years and years and years. I had a, I talked about this on a webinar recently. I had a blog post about it last year. I talked about it on LinkedIn, I think last week, even like the unit economics of your trade show are, are hard. Like when you're an industrial company, especially if your booth is too big for, um, for your, for your expense. And, and there's a lot of companies who, who have done trade shows for 20 years and have basically bloated that out for themselves, like made it way too big. And so when you look at companies doing 50 by 60 booths because they sell a bunch of equipment and they need enough space to show it all, and they're spending $230,000 on the trade show and they're getting a one, they're getting $100,000 in sales from it and losing a lot of money. And then you look at the number of badges they scan and it's like $755 a badge scan. And it's just those unit economics are hard. And so a lot of companies are going back to that, right? And to me, it's it's interesting to watch that. And one of my clients, the one of the ones I'd, I'd mentioned earlier, when you look through the unit economics of 
of the return they're getting on trade shows versus Google ads versus their webinar program of all things, their Google ads and their webinar program is way more efficient for them overall, especially when you don't consider when you when you factor in the the opportunity costs of of their marketing personnel having to put time to put the show together, which is hundreds of hours of their time. Um, let's just be frank about that. Plus hotels, incidentals, and meals and all that stuff. So I'm watching companies go back to this and I'm just thinking about it just holistically. And I'm like, there's just better ways to use your use your resources than this, not just money, but your personnel also to, to help create more demand. You're, you're orienting so much of your marketing sourced business for the year around three days. And that's the thing that always drives me nuts, right? A trade show, like your major trade show is like a three-day event, four-day event, right? And you're you're investing so much around this short time frame when you could, you know, do something with when you could do something else that could be like a 365 sort of effort. And so I always think about like the sort of the sort of all the eggs you put in that basket overall. And I, I always just I always just find that fascinating. So Clients going back to or, or people going back to trade shows, I think is just an interesting development. I believe people will be scrutinizing that cost a lot more. Um, I'm still fascinated by the lack of industrial executives I see on LinkedIn. And I've talked about that a lot, but I just I'm I'm always I'm just very curious as to why I watch SaaS founders get in on that. I'm watching agency people like yourself and like Chris and like Joe, who's my founder at Gorilla getting in and, and, and doing a lot on LinkedIn and driving a lot of business for themselves doing that too. Um, and then I'm watching manufacturing leaders by and large sit on the sidelines. Um, and I just, I find that interesting. I, I watch their salespeople get involved and in trying. Um, it's not a good execution, but they're there and they're trying to figure it out. But, you know, I think a, a lot of the, the reasons why industrial companies are not doing, in my opinion, much on LinkedIn is because, the companies who do really well on LinkedIn, it's entirely founder led or president or, or high executive led. And, you know, Casey, Casey Graham from Gravy talks about this. And I worked for Casey for a little while, but it's modeling the way, right? Like when you're the high, when the highest executive in your organization is modeling what other employees should be doing on LinkedIn, everyone will all of a sudden follow suit, especially when it's communicated in the internal communication channels that exist like Slack or Teams or whatever. You know, when you model that, people fall and follow suit. When you just kind of shotgun it out and go, I want people doing LinkedIn. Well, there's really no leadership or plan or strategy there. And so it all kind of falls on its face, especially when the CEO or the president doesn't necessarily believe yeah, I mean, in it or doesn't give it the time that it needs to to produce a tangible business result form. And especially when there's not like direct attribution, which is a whole other sort of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a, a leadership being involved in it or not is a make or break the whole strategy, the whole social media presence in most cases. I mean, we're working with companies uh, and I think doing something similar as, as gravy is doing, uh, you know, but if we look at the final result, it depends on how much the leadership has been involved from the start and throughout yep. the whole process. It very much depends on it. It's, uh, you know, make or break. That's ultimately one single thing that decides if there's going to be a result or no. And, uh, you know, like, but also one thing, one else that, uh, that I'm seeing is that, you know, founders, especially like in manufacturing companies, usually there are people that are in industry for some and, uh, you know, what I'm seeing is that they look at the leaders who are like, you know, even older than them and they are already on LinkedIn. They have established presence, but they have built like huge companies. Mm -hmm. And what they realize, don't, don't realize is that, you know, when you have a huge company, then LinkedIn is featuring the name of your company all the time in, in their feed. So you get the followers over there, then people know you, then you have the company with with many followers, with many employees. So that's also yeah. into the equation. And then they see, okay, they just go, you know, they contribute to the Forbes and the, somebody from their team writes the article. So that's the way to go. And then you need to go and explain it from a whole different perspective so they understand what's actually happening. Yeah, if, if you're, but if you're like a mid-sized industrial company, that's never going to happen for you, right? The only exactly. people who are getting like featured in Forbes is like if you're John Deere or Caterpillar 
or Ford or Tesla, right? Like, I mean, those people get on Forbes and the Wall Street Journal. You, $20, $30 million industrial company makes a really cool piece of machinery. Um, probably not going to get that kind of exposure. And so LinkedIn kind of becomes that PR outlet for you. But, you know, you're right. They watch people do that and they want to do it, but they don't want to take all the steps it takes to get there. Like Elon Musk surely was doing this on Reddit or somewhere else way before he ever got famous. And then all of a sudden, the Wall Street Journal gave us shit about what he had to say. Excuse my language. Um, but it's but it's it's true. Right. Um, and so the other thing is um, with the other thing with executives is like they kind of have a, a, a warped sort of look at the landscape of their buyer right now. I think I saw somebody post last week. I can't even remember who it was like, well, when millennials become decision makers, I'm like, dude, millennials at this point are decision makers at a lot of these companies. Yeah. And they are, I mean, we, we, are, we are millennials. So it's valid. Yeah, exactly. We I mean, I, 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 I decision make almost every piece of tech for my, for gorilla at this point from a strategy perspective. And I'm you know 36 years old. And so I guarantee you there's plenty of industrial companies out there who have people 35 to 45 making a lot of purchasing decisions for companies. And so, yeah, I mean, those people are decision makers at this point in time. So you can find them here if you plant the seeds and take the time, but most, most don't want to, they don't have the patience to watch that take hold or they've already structured their business in a way that doesn't make it sustainable. They've hired too many salespeople. They hire, want to hire more key accounts. People, they want to do account-based marketing, have no idea how to do it right. They don't equip their marketing people to do account-based marketing. Um, and so there's just this, this out of whack sink, like, and then the, the, the crux of that issue is most CEOs and executives at mid-sized industrial companies don't understand marketing and haven't hired a good enough marketing person who can explain it and execute it for them, right? It's so much of an entry level. And that's, that's a part of the reason why we, we get brought in is because, you know, executives could, if they wanted to, they could hire a more seasoned marketing leader, a do it all kind of person. And that's what I was by and large when I was at the welding company, at the construction company, prior to that, when I got started, you know, you can hire a do it all kind of person, but, um, but ultimately, like they need, they'll need additional resources, and also there's just the kind of compensation part of that too that that factors in as well. But they don't hire uh, a seasoned enough person to kind of close that gap for them, and so that's why their marketing never really gets there in the first place. And so that's that's a whole other sort of discussion and consideration to have. But but that's that's part of like I don't get marketing, so I don't know how to hire right for it. So I don't get out of it what I want, and so I never think it works. Yeah, exactly. I mean. We were working for a for a while with supply chain institute where like Joy Pulizzi is the founder, ex CEO mm -hmm. of IBM. Like those kind of people are in the board, and they're like, we understand that we need to be on social, but we have never seen the return of investment of being on social. Nobody ever explained it to us. So if you don't explain it, we don't see the reason why we should invest more in it. Okay, mm -hmm. you like just being present. That's enough. But like being present means only like posting on a company page from that perspective. Yeah. Not and I, that, like, enough. Yeah. Posting on the company page to promote your webinar or to like share your latest blog article. It's not to like share thought or like rally. That's the other thing that a lot of the other reason why a lot of executives, I don't think use LinkedIn in the manufacturing space is um, there's this SaaS founders and tech founders by and large do not fear polarity. Uh, like the polarity of their thoughts. Like some people are going to love what I say. Some people are going to hate it. And I don't care. I'm only interested in the people who love it. Right. But I'm actually interested in people who hate it too. Most executives in industrial, they want to play the middle all the time. Um, and that ultimately doesn't get you a lot of traction. Like if you're not willing to take a strong stance on something, then you try to cater to everyone. And so you never say anything that's like actionable or that, you know, rallies people around you. So I just, um, so to me, it's just the other thing is, is executives by and large need to, if they want to do something like organic social, like LinkedIn or Reddit or something else, they, they need to be unafraid of, of expressing a point of view that's going to drive disagreement and agreement with them. Because ultimately that's where, that's where you grow your, your following. Like 
I mean, when Elon Musk was talking about electric vehicles 12, 15 years ago, he had more naysayers than he had champions at that point. And he still has plenty of naysayers right now, right? And he doesn't care because he just keeps rallying people around his point of view. And you can say what you want about Elon Musk. And I, I know my former president at the Walden Company like loved him, revered him. And he was, and Elon Musk would say thing after thing after thing that would drive people towards him and drive people away from him. And he was comfortable with that and it worked. And most executives and industrial companies do not want to do that. They do not want to drive people away from them in any way, shape, and time because they always fear they're driving a customer away as opposed to thinking about, well, how many customers am I going to create if I continue with this track and keep trying to drive people around my point of view? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking like if uh, we can just go uh, to LinkedIn ads uh, or just to paid LinkedIn and, you know, create a group of couple of industrial leaders uh, that are actually posting something and get to somebody who, you know, who wants to understand what kind of content are they posting, what can they contribute. And if they see all the bullshit that people are posting, like del dolphins uh, or like the sea or like some trucks or whatever, which has nothing to do with their business, they will see mm -hmm. how, how, uh, low is the entrance to the place when you can actually contribute with great content over there. Or even like the thing I see the most common is, you know, it's very popular and industrial to post pictures of your installations, right? It's like, we just, we just installed, you know, 250 Swiss tech CNC machines at this, at this facility. Like once again, like we're just, you know, and those things are cool to post. I don't have a problem with posting that stuff, but if you're not posting like the state or the direction of CNC machining or manufacturing in general, whether it's moving to additive or whatever, um, you have to kind of think a level above what you sell and start there from a thought leadership perspective. And most, and then, and then you go down into those sorts of things, those installations, those success stories that you want to share with people. But until you like start a level up with an idea of how the world should be in regards to like where where you see your business going, you know, that kind of stuff is is just going to have a ceiling, right? Like a very pronounced ceiling at that. You're really only going to rally your employees around that and not necessarily your wider audience. And so if you're not thinking a level above, that's as far as you're going to get on, on organic social by and large. Yeah, I mean, the narrative is extremely important. And I think mm -hmm. so many companies don't have it. If they had it, they would kind of know where they can go with the content, with the strategy, with all the other stuff. And, right. you know, well, actually I, see the big picture behind just posting, you know, the, the installation photo. Right. And again, like, I, I think an executive or an industrial company having a really strong organic social strategy, there's very few. A Path Robotics is probably the, the one of the best ones that I know. Um, where they got, you know, John and they got Andy and they're, they're doing good things. They got other people as well involved too. Um, and they do a really nice job. And then mostly it's because you can look at a guy like John, John, John Wheeler, he's doing a lot of content curation for himself. Um, you look at a guy like Jake Hall, who is not tied to a company. He's his own entity, the manufacturing millennial, but he, he basically made an entire page out of an entire profile, an entire persona of himself did it out of curating other people's content. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of crazy to think about that, but, but with executives and industrial and industrial companies by and large, it's, you know, it goes back to not understanding marketing well enough and not having a seasoned enough person in house to get them there. Cause you can't, you can't do this managed. You can't outsource this to me as an agency and ask me to build your organic LinkedIn. It will never work. Like I don't, I don't have enough access to you to make that happen. You know what I mean? So you need someone inside to do it. And like uh, some company is going to try this and I think they'll be smart too, but like, you know, hiring a content manager within the company and just saying like, like, yo, half of your job is just getting the organic social strategy off the ground, figure out the subject matter experts at the highest level of the organization to, to build it around. And you just live in their office and interview them and talk to them and just, and sort of help them develop the strategy. And, and help develop. And if it, that means you take control of their accounts and you post for them. Um, and they just kind of, and they, and they kind of give you like sort of an editing sort of process. So be it. But as a starting point, I think that's a good way to go until they kind of get the sea legs of doing it themselves a little bit more. Um, but I think you can do it in house, but it, there has to be like, 
a really dedicated kind of strategy around it. Having someone who's skilled at social, who knows how to develop those sorts of things, whether they've done it for themselves or they've worked for smaller companies before. And then just saying, you're empowered to do this with individuals at the company. And that's all I want you to spend. I want you to spend half your time doing that. And I, I would love to see someone try that. And I bet it would be super successful. Yeah. I mean, what I see it, you can add to that, like being in charge of the main content pillars mm -hmm. as well. So they're coming in from the company and then you hire, outsource it to somebody that can take it and, you know, distribute it on a larger scale that can work as well. Uh, one thing that, that we're doing and I see a lot of other, uh, you know, companies are doing, we interview the leaders. And then we transcribe that to the social media post sometimes mm -hmm. if they don't have time or they don't want to, because it's basically using their own words. But yes. what's, what's interesting over there, what started to happen is that when they read it, they say like, I'm not talking that way, you know, and it's becoming, they realize the way they talk. It's not actually the way that they have been um, writing on the social so far. And then they change right. the whole thing, the narrative, the you know, the wording and all those other stuff. Yeah. It's the whole, the whole right, like you write, like you talk sort of method. And I think a lot of, a lot of people in general, it's not just industrial executives, right. But a lot of people mm -hmm. don't write like they talk. And there's like this fear of it, you know, colloquialism is, is sort of the, 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 the term for it of like sounding too unprofessional when you, but like, dude, it's social media. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be yeah. entertaining. It's supposed to be thought provoking. It's supposed to be challenging. You know, it's not supposed to be a technical paper. You know, it's not supposed to be your product manual. It's not supposed to be an instruction manual. It's not supposed to be a bomb sheet, you know, like write like you talk, be comfortable with that. Um, and just recognize that that's how people communicate and expect to expect to hear from you. And like that ultimately like gives, you know, connotes emotion or, 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 or things like that. So yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. And I, and, and yeah, I, I do think that's, that's a really smart way to go about it. Cause when you, most people, when they're just kind of speaking extemporaneously, they say really smart things and then you're like, Oh, we should make use of what you just said there. Let's figure out all different ways to repurpose that in a way that we can distribute it smartly for you. And you know, you do that, but a lot of companies don't have that sort of process in place or again, don't have a marketing person with the wherewithal to think of it like that. Yeah. Or they have too many eyeballs on each piece of the content and they want that's to ship another thing. out yeah, and, the and it gets, perfect it gets ones. Red tape, yeah. gets red taped to death. Yeah, that, that is definitely another thing that happens. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, tell, tell me a little bit uh, about what do you see works when it comes to the, to the ads, especially for like industrial companies. Uh, I guess it's it's LinkedIn, it's uh, I guess Google, Google Ads, PPC. Yeah, yeah those kind of because because I guess they they already have the most of them the existing demand for some of the things that they are doing. So like mm -hmm. I guess search works works nicely when it comes to Google. It can, yeah. I mean, so I, a lot of things I see with with industrial companies on Google Ads, especially, is just running a really bad landing page experience overall. So they'll bid on a lot of keywords and they'll send them to their homepage. And like that to me is just like, it's a recipe for disaster. Like, you know, figure out the ad groups that you want to run, keep the, uh, keep the keyword list tight. Like I try to not bid on more than 30 keywords overall. Um, and then break that out by ad group and then uh, try to keep it really focused from there. Um, run, you know, it's not a squeeze page, but certainly run a page that's, that's, you know, conducive to converting, you know, make it easy for them to take the next step if they want to. There's just a lot of friction that I see with industrial companies when they're running Google ads, they're running people to pages and people have no idea what to do next. Like they, the, the main, the conversion point is like on the bottom of the page to the bottom, to the right, you know, there's not, not a clear call to action button. Sometimes you want to put a form there just to say, Hey, here's the conversion. If you want it, if not read on, but I, a lot of things I see is just not optimizing the landing page experience towards the search intent. And to me, that's a lot of where companies go wrong. So you can be very simple in just making that adjustment to yourself, making a dedicated landing page for each ad group that you want to run helps it perform better for sure. Uh, in terms of Google's eyes and then, and then running short, running high intent keywords to it, 
get rid of broad match, dig into your search terms report and add and add and add negatives. And then also look at demographic data, which I always think is very interesting. So like I have one client I run ads for, um, and I looked at the demographic data and like top 10% of household income in the U S was just an overwhelming driver of conversions for them. And I'm like, okay, well let's, you know, focus there and then follow how they progress all the way through the, the funnel. Right. So like looking at, okay, now that they converted, what happens to them? Do they get the opportunity? Do they eventually get to close one? And sometimes we're an industrial where your sales cycle is six months. It takes a while to see that thing mature all the way, which is why I always tell companies, you got to give it a long time, but like, let's look at leading indicators, like how many conversions get the opportunity and let's use it as a jumping, as a jumping off point. Um, but yeah, for me, for Google ads, it's optimizing the landing page, keeping the keyword list tight, tracking conversions all the way through the funnel. Um, and then also like looking really, really closely at the copy on your landing pages. So if I see something underperforming and I'm looking at my heat map data and I'm looking at my click through rates and I'm like, I'm having no problem getting people to the page. I'm just having a problem converting it. I'm immediately looking at my web tab copy at the copy on the, on that page. And going, what do I need to change here to make, to make the copy more clear about what they do and who they do it for and why it's worth their time. Right. And so, you know, being able to audit when things aren't working well is another key skill to have. I have one client who I be frank with, I'm struggling with a little bit on their ads. And so I'm running through like all the different kind of checklist of items that I would look at to try to improve performance and basically going through each of those items one by one, trying to get a better result for them. It's not that they're doing terrible. I just would expect them to doing better, be doing better at this point based on what we're doing. I have another client who I'm killing it with and we're just kind of running that on autopilot right now. Um, yeah, and, uh, and yeah, what's okay. what's interesting to me, like looking at the Google Ads, is that you can you can uh, you know check each step, and you can show the client like where is the problem and what we need to optimize next. Mm -hmm. You know, is it the copy? Is it the landing page? Is it the form? Is it you know uh, the leverage or something that we need to get them to convert them like from uh, from cold to warmer, uh, you know, customers and those kind of things. And they can see where the problem is. In my experience, in most cases, it's in the landing page or in the form or in, or in the way they structure the offer, those kind of yeah. things. Because like we are in marketing, we know our stuff, we get the information, we start building those things and then we just optimize. But on their way, they didn't think of those things before they got actually people over there and then they see if they work or not. Yeah, it's it's really easy, I think, to, to spend and waste a lot of money on, on Google ads. And the other thing I think you have to figure out for yourself is like, you know, how much do I need to spend a month? I mean, a lot of companies spend too much on Google ads. And I think that's that's another issue mm -hmm. overall because there's only so much to capture there every every month. And uh, and I think figuring out the right amount, the right amount to spend is another sort of key thing. And the other thing is like looking at your landscape overall. So like, you know, one client I have, they're running Google ads. They don't have a lot of competition for not a lot of people are bidding on the stuff that they're doing. And so I'm like, well, if your product costs a hundred to $300,000 a pop and your cost per click is like three fifty, and you're getting conversions for $80 and you're converting X amount of those into opportunities. I mean, keep spending, man. You have, you have no reason to, to lower this right now just based on how everything is progressing and what the, the nature of your business and competition is. I have another client who's cost of cuts way higher. And so we got to be more judicious about it. Right. And so just looking at, you know, that's a understanding. This is why I ask all those foundational questions, right? Profit margin, average cost per average cost per piece of equipment. It makes me understand like why you should spend more or less here and why. So, so those, so those are definitely things that I, I like to look at. And I, I, I look at quite closely when I'm, running Google ads, LinkedIn ads is, um, is another scenario. So you, um, you look at LinkedIn ads and I think you need to look at what your goals are overall. The goal, if the goal is content distribution and generating awareness for your company. Okay. Start with the right stuff. Like overwhelmingly, I'll, I'll just say, I don't think I'm breaking any news here just to any SaaS marketers, but if you're industrial and you're running Google, uh, LinkedIn ads, the things that perform the best by far case studies, um, product marketing, like those things. And those do way better than any top funnel thing you could ever run. Like my, my case studies just blow it out three and a half percent click through rates, you know, 
minute time on page, just getting getting everything that I like consumption wise. Product marketing helps drive the conversions uh, down at the end. And the other thing is like you have to look at your spend versus your audience size versus you know how much money does it take for you to reach your audience at the frequency you need tells you how much content you need and then you need to look at if i have um if, if i work in a or if i'm marketing to an expensive sort of sector like medical device compared to maybe one like machinery or it's a little lower to get in front of that audience so again how much does my product cost is it recurring is it profitable to run uh, linkedin ads here how many conversions do i need to make that work and then, you know, by and large, a lot of industrial companies are just going to not spend a lot on LinkedIn. That's not very many are going to spend $20,000 a month. Most aren't even going to spend 10. You know, you're going to get three to $7,000 a month in LinkedIn ad budget. And so you got to make that work. And so have an audience that's requisite for that budget because in a 3,000, if you have, if you're running a 130,000 person audience on a 3K a month budget, you're never going to reach them enough, you know? So, you know, get really tight with that audience for that cost and make that work before you start to surface back up. Hey, we're making it work well with this 35,000 person audience at three grand a month. And we're driving, you know, 12 conversions a month here over the past 60 days. And, you know, I think we're ready to maybe jump up the spend here or test another audience at this point um, and see if we can make it work somewhere else. And so with LinkedIn, uh, a lot of it is like just looking at, objectives and looking at your budget and looking at what you have at your disposal to run again setting up conversions correctly set it up around the end result that you want which is the quote request or the demo request or the rf rf uh, rfq um and then you know don't skimp on your creative make sure you use the creative that's in the image to like communicate the message you want um i've seen you know i've seen a lot of companies that don't do that very much but that text is the text that captures people so you want to make sure that you are using the most out of that real estate and then figuring out the right objective, right? Because if you have $3,000 a month running in, in ads to spend, running website visit ads is going to just deplete your budget so fast. Um, so look for ways that you can drive people to your website for less. And so looking at brand awareness ads, looking at engagement um, ads as well is, is our two objective things that I, objective strategies that I've changed with clients to see if I could just get more people there for less cost because I just recognize I'm working with a lower budget. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are things to look at to see like, well, can I drive a $19 cost per landing page visit down to eight, eight fifty? And I've been able to do that with clients just by changing the objective and running the exact same content, the exact same audience. Right. So you have to play around with that stuff to figure out what's the most efficient way to get in front of them and then drive them to know more about my business. And then, you know, again, patience, take the time to keep communicating new messages, have like that, have that story you want to tell over that period of time, and then give it the time it needs to mature to drive conversions for your company. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing, I'm doing those things, actually, like I think last week I did it on Facebook, uh, is, you know, doing brand awareness engagement stuff. But, uh, you know, the most important thing for me is to make people engage on the post. That's mm -hmm. why, you know, I'm lowering the cost and making more people involved in it because they tag other people, you know, especially if you like name the, the common enemy that is unique for you and for them. And they then they go wild when you have that on a, on a visual, when you have uh, explanation in the copy and when you're making them do some actions and they always have the link that they can go and convert and then conversion goes um, sort of like organic like yeah. to do organic because like somehow we've been doing ads in a different way that we are doing organic and creating engagement organic. And now I think the change is happening and we, then we are starting to realize uh, how we can do that through ads as well. Yeah, hundred percent. You can absolutely do it, do it through ads. And it's, it's wild. Cause like, you know, even five years ago I was running ebook downloads or, I was trying to get people to do demo requests for products. And I was just like watching how this worked. I was like, God, this is so stupid. This is not working at all. And when you think about social media for what it is, paid social is the same as organic in the sense that it's a, you're paying to get in front of your ideal customer, but you got to have something to say. Like the, the beauty of like, you know, the, one of the things I always tell 
companies when we talk about paid social versus paid search is like paid social, you have so much more creative freedom to do whatever you want to tell people what you want to say about your company. And you can use video and you can use images and you can use gifts and you can use carousel ads and you can, you can just be way more expansive with the things you want to describe and tell people on paid social. And you know, and guarantee it gets delivered to the right people, which the reason why we drive most of our clients, because there's just, there's a lot more ambiguity on Facebook ads, right? As marketers, we're comfortable with that. We get that. We don't, it's, it's okay. For executives, they're not as okay with it, especially if you're going to, if you can't guarantee job title targeting or stuff like that, right? So LinkedIn's great in that regard, because you obviously have the demographics data that you can pull from LinkedIn on the on the campaign manager and go, look, here's all the companies that we're hitting. Here's all the industries. Here's all the job titles. Here's all the job functions. And that gives people a lot of peace of mind that we're heading in the right direction. Because, you know, creating demand, again, takes months of time, not weeks of time. And so when you're able to at least show them who you're getting in front of, and then you're able to, just like your search terms report on Google ads, if you see a job title popping up that doesn't look right, like, exclude that. You see a company in there that's not looking right, exclude that, right? And so you can keep working through that audience to to pin it down. Maybe you start at 50,000, maybe you whittle it down to 30 30,000, but it's like such a tight 30 that like you know if you're consistent there, you're going to get the end result that you want, which is people putting you first in line when they have a need. And whether that comes from organic traffic, direct traffic or the conversion happens right on LinkedIn, who cares? You got the goal you wanted. You got the you got the high intent conversion and the person who wants to work with you, right? Exactly. And guys, if you're listening to this, I recommend you go go back like ten minutes and listen to Matt again talking about those stuff because most of the things that I'm seeing on LinkedIn, the companies are doing. Uh, there are a few good examples, but besides that, companies are just having you know one liner, one sentence, and asking them to click to read something or to do something, you know, but they're not giving them anything, anything in the feed. So mm -hmm. they don't have enough reason to actually click or to go and do something. And I think they're just like wasting money on that. Oh yeah. I mean, gosh, out of the one client I'm doing LinkedIn ads with quite a bit and I'm doing really well for them, like 55% of the conversions are view conversions, <laughs> you know, and that's fine. I can show that and go, look, we have, you know, you have, seven view conversions this month and five clicks. Great. Fantastic. But can I, it's showing up as direct traffic. I know this. And so I, you know, put the, how to share about us. Sometimes I get LinkedIn, sometimes I get social media, sometimes I get other things, but like, but yeah, I mean, the view conversion is, it doesn't matter whether it's view or click in the grand scheme of things. The, the fact is you were in front of them. And if you're in front of, I've been running out to this client now for like six months. So at this point, I'm confident that what I'm doing is resulting in this. Um, you know, it's coming through the way that it should. And we've got the right job titles and we got the right companies and these people that you can see what they have in terms of like, tell us about your project. And there's detail to that, you know, and that tells you that you have been in their feed. You've been giving them information. They know who you are, what you provide. And there's definitely, uh, there's definitely like an ICP fit. And so, yeah, I mean, to me, it, it doesn't really matter where it comes from necessarily. It just matters whether or not what you're doing to communicate to them is, is producing that desired result. And then you get to reverse engineer that as much as possible to figure out, well, what am I saying that's working? How is it working? And what can I do to expand on that or remix that into a new kind of message? And so some of the things I've done, I've, one such client I'm doing that for, you know, we're, we're talking about how their machine fits in the face of the modern landscape. We know that they're not, com they're not competing against manual labor on top of other competitors in their space. And so we talk about like the productivity parts of it, which I hate the word productivity, but that's another story for another day. We definitely talk about how they were like one of the first to do this and we had one of the best machines in the, in, the, in the industry. But somebody actually happened to comment on the ad like this is I've worked with every single machine in this space for, for 10 years. This is the best. There's no reason to really go with anyone else. And I was like, great, let's clip that and let's put that on the creative and let's just run that as a, as another ad creative. And I am, and it's just freaking killing it. So, so yeah, I mean, just using the feedback loops you get from people on, on your, on your demand gen plays, and then putting that in as social proof or anything like that you can for your creative, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that you, you got to be looking at and doing as a, as anyone running, running the man gen for, for your, for an industrial company or any company for that matter. 
Yeah, man. Tell me for the end something that we didn't talk about, that we didn't mention, or something yeah. that you you want to emphasize. Oh, something for me? Oh, that, mm -hmm. that I want to emphasize? Sure. Um, I think by and large, and I have we have this in the show notes, so I want to get into it as the last thing that we have sort of here. But like most executives like want to market to their audience in a way that they would never allow uh, on, on themselves, which is like low intent lead gen, SDR touch points, email sequences over and over and over again, automated email sequences, as opposed to just like building relationships you know, not, not trying to brute force people into a demo or into a, into a quote request, um, you know, focusing on providing and driving and creating value for your client overall, playing the long game, which is just so hard for people to do, but they absolutely should do it. The compounding interest of playing the long game is massive. Um, focusing on, I mean, I, we, we, I, we talk a lot about paid, but having a good organic program on top of your paid and and that takes, and a good organic program takes even longer than a good paid acquisition program to develop. And so having the patience for that as well. Um, and so if you want really strong marketing in your organization, you need to have a reasonable set of expectations, a reasonable type of investment, and you need to have alignment with your sales team. There has to be just a feedback loop there. So that to me is that those to me are all the things that you absolutely have to have in order to, to create an effective marketing program, industrial or otherwise. Yeah, it's good that you kept on talking because I was offline for like a minute and a half, something like that. But yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't know if it's in the stream, but it doesn't matter. We'll have the full episode anyway. Uh, okay, um, so I have no idea what you have said. I just, I, I, I just, <laughs> I just talked about, I, I just talked about like having, uh, you know, building a strong organic and paid acquisition program is important market to people in a way that you would want to be marketed to and not in a way that like is going to annoy you. Like most companies will still run automated email sequences and cold calls off ebook downloads and, you know, try to brute force people into demos or quote requests. And you don't have to run that playbook anymore just because of the tools that are available to you, the ways people buy right now. And it all comes down to just having the right set of expectations, which is playing the long game, long game, understanding the time it takes to build both those competencies organic and paid the the upshot of, of those compounding investments and overall just that's what it takes to build a mature marketing program right now um, in the industrial space or otherwise 100 percent agree i mean what, what i'm telling to everybody when uh, you know when we start working or start talking about working is that you know you need to get to know your customers if you don't know them already, because like marketing will just mark the way that they come to buy your product, mm -hmm. or something like that. Because you know we need to be present on each step of the way, and if it's something new, then we need to go and you know know when they got the intent, so we can go before that. And you know sometimes simplifying things as much as possible. Like, would you do this? Uh, you know, would you market that well if you're doing it yourself or no? Can make the uh, companies realize what they're doing or, or is it good or it's not? Yeah, 100%. Yep. So uh, tell me and the people where they can find you and kind of continue the conversation and keep yeah. the flow going. For sure. So LinkedIn, Matthew J. Chanella. Um, I'm sure the spelling will be in the show notes. Um, you Definitely. can find me on Twitter at Matt underscore Chanella. Those are the two main places to get in touch with me probably. Um, and then you could obviously reach me anytime. DMs are always open, always open to connecting, always open to talking. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, you want to get in touch with me. Those are both the ways to get me. I mean, definitely check out if you work in the industrial space, my company, uh, Gorilla 76, we do really awesome work. If you ever want to talk with us, we're pretty, we're pretty low, uh, we're pretty low pressure on the, you know, the, the, the sales process. You know, we definitely like just talking about where you want to go and seeing if there's a fit. Uh, we definitely like, you know, kind of a mutual benefit there. So yeah, if you want to ever talk anything like that, just feel free to reach out and be happy to talk or even otherwise. Yeah. And, and I can say that just visiting, oh. visiting gorillas, gorillas website is a great way to start because you have lots of content over there for free so people can see what the strategy is all about with videos, with text, with all kinds of resources. 
for sure. What, one more thing I'll plug my podcast, the industrial marketing show with MJ Peters, who's been on this show. Uh, we have a lot of fun on there and uh, yeah, whenever you want to check that out, just check it out. You can get it on Apple or Spotify or anchor. Uh, we're not, we're not saying Google anymore. Cause it's not a major podcasting platform. We're going to MJ. Yeah, guys, <laughs> I recommend you do that. No matter if you are into industrial marketing or no, like MJ and Matt are, uh, you know, giving up some gems over there or uh, what I especially like is, you know, like you, you just see a LinkedIn post or something that gets your attention and you go in depth uh, and discuss about those things. So, so those are also the things that, that uh, I like. And one of the things why I'm recommending the podcast, uh, Matt, thank you uh, for being here, for being an awesome guest uh, guys. Thank you for, uh, for staying with us, for watching. I don't know how the live stream went, but it doesn't matter. We'll send you the full, the full recordings uh but one thing for the end that i'm always saying is just keep in fun keep it funky and keep it real and things will come together oh.